20 years ago, a comedy programme appeared on BBC One that was scheduled to run for just six weeks, while 12 series later, it was still going strong, and now 10 million people a week are enjoying the repeats. Who do you think you are kidding, Mr Hitler, if you think we're on? Stop your little game We are the boys Who will make you think again Cos we Oh, isn't that wonderful? Our guests this morning are Bill Pertwee, alias Chief Warden Hodges in the series, and Ian Lavender, alias Private Pike. Good morning to you both. I love listening to that music. It's brilliant. I always assumed, Bill, that it was an original 40s song. Mm. I think a lot of people did, but, I mean, it captures the, the, the mood of the 40s superbly well. I mean, it's a very, very clever bit of, of, of music to put in, in front of that programme. Uh, and it was the last thing that Bud Flanagan, of course, recorded before he died. But, uh, and, and Bud's voice, if you listen to it, it's almost the same as when he was recording songs in the late 30s and early 40s, things like Music Maestro, Please, and uh, Hometown, and things like that, you know, and Run, Rabbit, Run. Uh, it, it's just amazing. But a lot of people did think it was uh, originally written in, in the 40s. Including your mother. <laughs> Including my mother, yes. Well, yeah. of course, you're getting loads of new fans for the new series now. Ian, it, when you did it, you were sort of the baby of the cast, weren't you? I was as old as the fans who are starting now, yes. Yeah. Oh, well, they're very much the baby, yes. Yeah. First thing I did. Were you looked of... after by the rest of them? Not they? at all. <laughs> <laughs> not at all. I mean, why do I look? I mean, no, heavens, I'm, I look as old as easy. He's got his bus pass. We thought he was a terrible big head, but we did. Yes. Because he used to do the Times Crossword in five minutes. Oh. And we thought, oh I'm getting old now. It's 20 like minutes now. Clever dick. <laughs> <laughs> I well, finish one a week. I, I can't even what? do the children's crossword. <laughs> <laughs> let's take a look at Bill and Ian in action with, of course, the Warmington on Sea Home Guard. Classic stuff. Oh, brilliant stuff. Now, neither of you really expected that you'd, you to, you'd, it would become kind of major role stream. I mean, the first episode didn't really promise um, a lot of exposure for either of you, really, did well, it? Well, not for me. No. I mean, no. I mean, uh, Ian you was... You weren't in it, I mean, Ian was, <laughs> was part of the Magnificent Seven, as I've said in the book. And, uh, but I, I was an outsider. As far as we were concerned, I was concerned, it was... Um, I got a job. Yes. That's right. Oh, a television job. Wonderful. Yeah. And it, it lasts for six weeks. Didn't know anything about it. I mean, to the extent that I th when we went off filming the first day, I arrived as I was. I didn't realise we were staying the night. Oh. I, I had to go home and get some clothes to take with us to film. I didn't know what went on. I was so green it was untrue. So, oh, yeah. so a bit like your character, really. Somewhat. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, no, uh, nice clip you got there. The hair was receding already. <laughs> yes. Well, look, Jimmy Perry, one of the writers, of course, is in our London studio. Good morning to you, Jimmy. Hello. Now then, as, as we were mentioning earlier in the programme, you actually um, were in the Home Guard yourself, so did you base an awful lot of what we see on your own experience? Yes, I was 15, boy of 15 at the time, and it all came from my experience. You see, when I first got the idea to, about the series in 1967, I did a bit of research and nobody knew anything about it, totally forgotten, an army of two and a half million men. And the thing is, a very important thing, uh, they weren't all elderly people or senior people in the Home Guard. There were a lot of young boys uh, and people waiting for call-up. But we took these characters because they represented a sort of cross-section of the characters I'd known. And the boy, Ian, was based on me as a boy. And my mother used to say, <laughs> you can't go out all night on manoeuvres out your scarf. And I, we were issued with uh, uh, arms after a little while. We got some arms, and I had a, a Thompson submachine gun that fires 100 rounds on a drum, rather used in gangster films. And we used to take them home. We only allowed 20 rounds, and we had to had be counted three times a week in case we shot it off in the back garden. You're not a boy of 15 or 16. I opened the door, and my mother stood there and looked at me. She said, you're not bringing that thing in the house. <laughs> <laughs> well, it... You see, we're desperate stuff, desperate <laughs> There wouldn't be so many hooligans about today if they could all be given submachine guns. <laughs> let's, let's talk to our first caller this morning, Richard Setti from London. Good morning, Richard. Good morning. Hello. Who would you um, like to talk to, Richard? Um, Bill, please. Yes. yes Richard. What would you yes. like to say? Um, I, um, I'd like to ask you a question. That, uh, did you ever wish you were part of the Home Guard in the series, not the Militia's Air Raid Warden? Oh, no, no, no. I was very glad I was the Warden, because I could be very, very nasty, you see. I would have had to be a bit, a bit nicer if I'd been one of the Home Guard, or probably very nice. No, and I think it's very important. If you ever go to a pantomime, Richard, you'll, you'll find that there's always a baddie and the goodie. And I think it's very right that, that people should be uh, able to identify with one or the other, like Cowboys and Indians, whatever it might be, uh, Laurel and Hardy, all those silent films. There was always a baddie and a goodie. And I think it's quite good, and I enjoyed being the goodie. 
Or the baddie, rather. And are you enjoying the series, Richard? Yes, I am. I think it's very funny. Brilliant. Well, it's, I'm sure it's nice for you all to know that you've got all these new young fans watching the programme. It's lovely. Now. Yeah, keep, keep watching, Richard. Oh. One thing I wanted to ask you is that uh, you were um, watching it, it's really obvious that one of the reasons, one of the great, the reasons why it's such a success is that you were all very strong actors and the characters were all equally strong in their own way. Was there ever any, any kind of upstaging between you? Did you try and kind of <laughs> Bill pushed out, outdo each other? I did, a lot of push. I did a lot of pushing and shouting. <laughs> yeah, a lot, lot of pushing and shouting. Try not uh, to stand near him in a rehearsal. <laughs> I think I think everybody was after their own corner, as I've said before. They, they, you know, but they all integrated. But they, they were, they were all, they all had their uh, different egos. They were, they all had their eccentricities. Uh, but, but they all combined to make a marvelous, a marvelous series. So, Jimmy, how did you handle them all? With great difficulty. <laughs> <laughs> they could be a miserable lot of old sons. <laughs> the very first day of the filming. My friend David Croft, my partner and friend, who's now Swanick in his villa in the Algarve, otherwise he'd be here today, uh, we were ready to do the first shot, and he had this Rolls-Royce, terrible swank pot, and he'd driven it into this field, and the whole crowd was sitting in this Rolls-Royce, and all the windows were steamed up. And David said, Jimmy, go and tell them all ready. And I opened the back door of this Rolls-Royce, all steamed up, and there was Arthur Lowe, looking very red in the face, John Le Measurer, uh, Clive done all of them sitting there and I said we're ready to start shooting and Arthur said We'll come when we're ready <laughs> and I went close the door and I went back to David and this first day shooting I said I think we've got some very difficult people <laughs> <laughs>that if it had been a commercial, nothing, I'm not knocking commercial television anyway, but if it had been a commercial television station putting on, they would not have hung on for the two mm. years it took for Dad's army to get off the ground. I said, and I'm, now I'm giving a plug for the BBC, but I <laughs> yes. feel this very strongly. Okay, uh, well... These people kept it going, and that's what made the, the perseverance, made it the success. Apart from the fact that it had a wonderful cast, it was the right time, the right moment, everything was right. Never, very rarely happens when you're creating something. Absolutely brilliant. Okay, nice to clear that one up anyway. Let's talk to Eddie Maguire now from Bridgewater. Hello, Eddie. Hello, good morning. Um, I'd like to speak particularly to Bill, actually. Mm -hmm. Good morning, Bill. Good morning, Eddie. Um, do you remember some time ago on Radio 3 when the uh, cricket was on and the ball-by-ball -ball commentary? Yes. Cricket, and you were asked to uh, do a piece and you spent a good part of the afternoon talking about the, your times with uh, Dad's Army. Mm. And uh, I must admit, you entertained us with uh, your tremendous ability to mimic everybody. <laughs> and I wonder, well, you know, if, if you'd like to... Do it again, do you think? <laughs> well, I, I think that I, I have done a little bit this morning that, uh, you know, John Lemosha used to say, I, I, do you think that's why? I said, Arthur <laughs> said, if Arthur was asked a question, he's always sort of hold back a wee bit and say, yes, well, uh, no, mm, I don't know about that. <laughs> Jones, Jones, <laughs> Jones, <laughs> Wilson, Wilson, go ahead. It's a sort of, uh, um, I don't know, I suppose being with people for, for a while, you, you, uh, you, you, something brushes off, you know? Hmm. <laughs> oh, that's, that's brilliant. Thank you for that, Eddie. It was very enjoyable seeing him do that. Now, we've got um, a question here from Claire Franks from Staines and Middlesex for you, Ian. She says, was it hard to play such an idiot, or is he really like that? <laughs> <laughs> Don't know how to take that, really. Is he me really like that? Uh, no, it wasn't hard to play. Well, it was hard to play, um, because if you're going to play just an idiot, um, you lose the sympathy straight away. I, I, I like to think he was rather a naive rather than an yes. idiot. I'd just like to thank Jimmy also for writing the sex scene that he wrote for Frank Pike. Unfortunately, Frank Pike didn't realise it was a sex scene, so we didn't get to play much of that. <laughs> oh. The scene was super. But, um, he was propositioned, wasn't he, by a Propositioned and kept girl. out all night, he was. <laughs> <laughs> and then they wrote an episode also, um, briefly about these mannerisms that he got, um, about Private Pike suddenly having to go and pull this face. And I said, well, why suddenly has this character got this... You know, why, Jim? You know, suddenly, a whole episode about it. He said, well, you do it. I didn't know I did it, apparently. Look back, and I, I, I do do it, Ooh. apparently, and without realising. Oh, what was the question? Uh, which was, um, yes, I did enjoy playing it, but yes. I wouldn't say it was an idiot. No. OK. Right, Jack Aston from Bristol, good morning to you. Hello. Hello. <laughs> um, uh, lovely. This is the first time I've done this, so uh, there you are. The You're question... in good hands, Jack. Hey? <laughs> You're in good hands, don't worry. <laughs> Thank you. The question I'd like to ask both the, the actors there is, is whether the actor is allowed to change the script if he feels something different might improve the humorous impact. 
He's shaking his head. I think, I think we ought to put that to Jimmy, actually, yes, and please. ask whether ever allowed them to. Yes, please. Jimmy. <laughs> Can I say this? Not a single word. <laughs> <laughs> actors love to rewrite. They're good writers, actors, if you give them a script that's already written on a pencil. <laughs> but fortunately, and I have to say this, no, they're marvellous. We all work together. If an actor suggests something, we incorporate it. But not often. But they are very good. But the thing is, you've got to understand that everybody wants to interfere with the script. Now, when I was an actor, I was just as guilty as all the others. But we, we like to think that once we've put it down on paper, it is right for the actor. On the other hand, if it isn't right, we discuss it. But they, a lot of people think, you know, that scripts, the actors make the words up as they go along. I'm not as saying that you think that, but uh, they do. They think it just, you know, comes out of thin air. But by and large, no. Okay, actually, there's something I'd like to ask you, Jim. I've noticed yes. um, from um, looking and watching the series, there's an awful lot of, of kind of catchphrases and punchlines, you know, put that light out, may I be, ex be excused, you stupid boy. Yeah. Where did they come from? Did you deliberately write those in? No, they all came from real life. David and I both wrote them in. Uh, permission to speak, sir, came back originally in the British Army. If you saw the, that marvellous film, The Charge of the Light Brigade, after they'd galloped through and there were about ten of the left, the wretched man got up with his hat cut in two, covered in, in, in gunpowder and said, permission to speak, sir, can we go again? <laughs> now, you see, the point is that's the eternal idiot. But the point is, in the British Army, if you addressed an officer, not in the past 50, 60 years, you had to say permission to speak so he said yes my man what is it <laughs> that was one of them don't panic was just something that crept up you stupid boy was used to me when I was a boy um, and most they don't like it up and that catchphrase <laughs> of Christ um, was actually used when I was in the home guard and we had an instructor an old soldier who say we want to give him the coast to you I don't like it up him you see but I don't know anybody that does like it up him, do you <laughs> <laughs> there is no answer to that but Ian did you mind being called a stupid boy for all those years um, no, not at all. Um, I'm quite flattered when people say it nowadays. They might think I'm still a stupid boy. Um, <laughs> the, uh, pure age thing, pure age. I'll be getting my bus pass soon. Um, I hope not so. at all. I mean, it, 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 mine. <laughs> it was all sort of gentle humour, really, wasn't it? It wasn't well, it, spiteful. It was because the difference to me for the whole series, anyway, was that, and even now, is that the reaction is one of affection. Yes. Not one of, oh, that's the funniest thing ever on television. They well said, but they actually said with affection. So when people said, well, did, you, did, you, did your mum know you're out, got your scarf on, stupid boy, it was all done with affection. So no, you didn't mind at all. We had, had a call from Holland today, obviously get it over there. Janet Seagar says, um, what do the actors think seeing the series again after 20 years? Oh, I think it's... Uh, I've, I've picked up bits that I didn't, mm. uh, that, that I didn't really... Uh, note uh, the first time round. I suppose one was too close to it and you were actually making it at that time so maybe there wasn't time to, to look, look into it but now <clears throat> I find that there's some bits that I think are wonderful. I think that it also it's um, it was gentle humour. Nobody asked you to laugh at, at, at the programme. If people wanted to laugh or be amused they did. Today I think it's become Humour has become rather violent, uh, blue, whatever you might say, well, that's, I suppose, progress. But uh, here it comes back again, this gentle programme, uh, with a lot of style. That's the thing, style. Gone out of, gone out of television recently, style. Over, right, to you, um, over to you, Ian. If I could just say, uh, I think the reason why 10 million people are watching it again 20 years old is that um, if there's a message, if there's a message, Jim, that five generations can sit down and watch it all together. Absolutely, yes. and they're very obviously doing that. Thank you so yes. much for all yes. of you coming in and uh, talking about it today. It's great to see it back on the screens again. Jimmy, thank you very much thank indeed. You. Bye, Ian Jim. and Bill, thank you thank very you. much. Let me just tell book. you, that's just about it from, from Open Air for today. Um, tomorrow's programme will be coming from Ealing Film Studios, where classics like Whiskey Galore and Kind Hearts and Coronets were made. And you can talk to film buff Sheridan Morley about Ealing's golden moments. Wendy Richards, EastEnder Pauline Fowler, of course, will be there to take your calls. And we want your views on television policemen. How do they match up? We'll be joined by TV cops old and new. Peter Byrne, who played Inspector Crawford from Dixon of Doc Green, also made at Ealing. Ian Hogg, the BBC's Sergeant Rockcliffe. And John Isles, DC Dashwood from The Bill, will also be joining us. And can I just say that Bill's actually written a book about uh, his experiences in Dad's Army, which you can now get. It's been uh, great fun today. We hope to see you for some more fun tomorrow. Bye-bye.